views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show that's coming up right next. The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Yeah, we've got it. I'm telling you, this is power packed. You know, today, Dr. James Kelly is joining me here today, and we are going to kick it up a few hundred notches here. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. What leads one person to interview 90 executives? What is it about that? Who does that? Who does that? I wish I would have done that. Instead, (laughs) I interviewed I interviewed 200 very depressed people that lost their jobs, and then I got depressed. So <laughs> I should have done what, what I should have done what, what he did. Uh, but you know, listen, folks, this is a show that for me it's really important to have this conversation. Listen, what makes us as human beings authentic? Well, Dr. James Kelly knows what it's like, wears many hats, and he's on a mission. He's like us. He's on a mission. But the mission is what? That's what we're going to hear from him today. Hey, it's great to have you here, Dr. James. Great to have you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Pat, for uh, bringing me on. Let me chat with you. Well, listen, let's talk about your podcast for a minute, because I love that. Um, And you know what? I'm one of these people that for about 14 years love sharing the wealth with other people that have had the nerve to put a microphone up to their face and then not go into complete hiding. How did you get started doing that, doing that, doing your radio show? Well, I mean, the... (laughs) I would say the short answer is, but I don't think there is one. Uh, yeah. The reality is, is that um, I was desperate for knowledge in mm. a certain field. And so when I initially started the podcast, I was really interested in CEOs, consultants, and book authors around the idea of corporate health and wellness. And so I thought there's no really better way than just to ask them. And as you know, after doing this for 14 years, if you give someone a mic and you ask them questions, they'll tell you a lot of things. And ah. so and so I thought, what better forum than to get people on a podcast to interview them and let them just kind of tell me their dirty little secrets. Oh, yeah. And, you know, let, uh, here's the deal. They say they tell you things that they would never tell their own organizations or people. So I can only imagine what happens with that. But the question really is, isn't it time now for all of us to get real? Tell me what your thoughts are about that. I think getting real in, in, in the world that, in words that I'm trying to use is get authentic yep. is such a difficult thing to do. Yeah. And you know, I, in my in my humble opinion, I think the biggest reason why it's hard is that we're afraid of the judgment that people are placing on us. And we tend to want to live in a little bit of a safe cocoon. And I get that from a psychological safety perspective. But the reality is, is that you only, you're only allowing yourself to be about 15, 30, 40, 50 percent of yourself, whatever it is for you. And it's, it's really hard to be vulnerable. And to let your hair down, so to speak. Now, I'm bald, so that's not an option for me. So whatever <laughs> analogy you want to go with. But it's hard to do that. And what I'm trying to learn through this book, and there's been some other people before me, great authors, Carissa Thatcher, uh, Bill George, who have written books about authentic leadership, is that I'm trying to just take it a little bit further and bring in some different ideas to what I think that means. I want to ask you this question because I don't know. 
about, you know, your journey with this. But I'll tell you for me, getting authentic for me has been a result of some very, very tough times in my life. And knowing that the alternative to authenticity usually ends up in pain, disease, and mental illness for me. But, you know, how about you? Why has this been pulling on? Well, wait, okay, maybe your apron strings, but why has this been pulling at your heart? Yes, that's a great question, Dr. Pat. I think that I have been on this life journey. And so I'm just going to share with you a quick little story about about, about my life. So I grew up in Portland, Oregon, so just down the road from you. And I grew up in a a middle-class family, lower-middle-class family. And both my parents worked. And, you know, they were the typical parents at the time. They would go to work at 7, 7 7.30, come home at 5, 5 5.30. And I was the youngest of three, but I was the youngest by five years. And so I was kind kind of an only child. And so I grew up in this house that was a bit typical Irish Catholic, minus the, the Catholicism, really. <laughs> just, but, um, but the reality is, is that I always got to this point when I was about 13 years old, and, and there was this really close family, friend, almost like a surrogate mom. And I walked into the house, and I remember saying this so vividly. I said, Linda, I will never lie again. Now, clearly, someone at 13 doesn't come to that. Mm. unless something manifested itself in the environment they're being raised in. And it almost started at 13, me being as authentic and real as I possibly could be. And I kind of have a rule of thumb of we're, we're authentic within 15 degrees left or right, 15%, <laughs> right? right? We could turn it yeah. up 15%, we could turn it down 15%. But when you start getting to the 50% mark, then you're not being true and honest to yourself. And so I, I, I started interviewing these executives and I really kept thinking to myself, wow, that person is just spot on honest and compassionate and caring and relates to everybody. And this executive is X. But what you just said, Pat, before I started my my long rant Mm -hmm. about you got authentic when you went through some hard times. Yeah. And that is called going through the crucible or the moment of truth. And these leaders that I find that are truly authentic have gone through some of the most amazing, horrific, transformative moments in their life based on that crucible. And so they were going down X path and they jump the track to the Y path based on that transformation. It doesn't have to be horrific and tragic, but what I found is for most of them, it was something that was, you know, jaw dropping. There were, and, and so I kind of have this theory that the more dynamic the crucible, the bigger the pendulum swings. Mm. Yeah. You know, this is such an interesting conversation. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to share something with you. I've never even talked about on you. You know, my mom died when I was six, a suicide. I was homeless at 17. And by the time I hit 19, I was arrested in Plainfield, New Jersey. Now here's why. Um, Back in the hippie days, if I could just say, we used to wear, you know, these jackets, these leather suede jackets that had the long frills on them. Oh, you yeah. Know, the lo- you know, those really bon Jovi. cool. Oh, man. Those jackets, bon Jovi jackets right? Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, you got to know that in my 61 Volkswagen, I had to have a jacket like that, right? <laughs> right. Awesome. I had to have that jacket. So yeah. I, get, I get pulled over late one night. And of course, if you can imagine me in a 61 Volkswagen with all sorts of peace sign things on it, right? All of the above. Policeman pulls me over and he starts to search my car. So here's what happens. I lean over, right, to say, what are you doing searching my car? And I got very close to him, you know, almost reaching his hand. And the frill on my jacket, are you ready? Hooks around his gun. Oh, no. Oh, my God. And <laughs> and we're like in this moment from like the Twilight Zone, right? And he m- pushes me away. So what do you think happens when he pushes me away? I- I'm going to go with you. You fall down and the gun comes out. I oh, know. No. I'm dragging tassel his gun. We're ta- oh, the tassel no. grabs his gun. Oh. It grabs his gun. And and so he's pushing me. And the more he pushes me, the more tugging on his gun. Oh, my goodness. All right. So long story. I'm going to make it short. We end up, I get an attorney. We're in court. 
I, I'm a li- I'm a teenager here still, yeah. and I'm in court. And the attorney says, "You got to make up a story. This is a stupid story. I don't even believe this story." <laughs> and I said, "What do you mean? You're my attorney. You don't believe the story." And I had a moment in front of this judge in Plainfield, New Jersey, mind you, in court where I looked at my attorney and something told me, tell the truth. That Uh, was uh, for me, my, I don't know, how do you, how you talk about it? But that is that crucible. That is the moment where. That was a moment of truth for you. Literally, that was a moment of truth. And here's what the judge said. And then we'll go to break. The judge says, you know, you can't make up a story like that. The judge a woman. She says, nobody makes up a story like that. And she looked at my attorney and she said to him, I bet you told her not to tell that story. And I shook my head up and down. And. She dismissed the, 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 she dismissed. So uh, for me, I had a moment where it was a, one of the scariest moments of my life. When we come back, I want to know from you, Dr. James Kelly, what was the scariest moment of your life? My fingers are tapping. <laughs> we'll be I'm right waiting. back, everybody. Tune in to The Jen Royster Show, intuitive guidance to inspire your life, each Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This amazing show is an inspirational hour that will take you on an epic metaphysical journey to discover the spiritual approach to life's greatest challenges. Dr. Jen is an internationally known intuitive counselor, spiritual teacher, and energy healer. Call in for intuitive readings and visit jenroyster.com for more information. Did you know that all of the shows on the Transformation Radio Network are available as podcasts to stream or download? Really? Check us out. Go to transformationradio.fm. We have business shows, spiritual shows, energy healing shows, and pretty much everything in between. Something for everyone guaranteed to inspire, educate, and transform. We are transforming the world one listener at a time. Be you plus live your purpose equals joy. That's the motto of Unstuck Joy with Vicki Todd. Vicki believes you were born with gifts that are meant to make the world brighter. Each show will feature an art visioning journal prompt to help you create your way to soul clarity. If you're ready to get unstuck and create more joy, this show is for you. Tune in every month on Transformation Talk Radio. For more information, visit VickiWorldArt.com. Discover the healing medicine from the giant monkey tree frog, Cambo. Cambo practitioner Ginny Rutherford and professional psychic Todd Rolson have come together for lively discussions of alternative healing medicines from the Amazon. Ginny and Todd bring you Cambo Talk Radio. Tune in each Monday at 1 p.m. Pacific to hear from guests all over the world with real life stories and the medicinal benefits of Cambo. For more information, visit CamboKiss.com. Curious about the meaning of life? Do you want to deepen your spiritual practice? The School for Esoteric Studies offers online training to spiritual seekers from all paths of life and individual coaching. Our courses synthesize Eastern and Western spiritual traditions based on meditation, study, and service applied to everyday life. The school also organizes group meditations each year to benefit humanity. Whether you're just beginning to reflect on the spiritual side of your life or are a more experienced spiritual seeker, the school warmly welcomes you to join our group. To learn more about our courses and services, please visit esotericstudies.net. That's esotericstudies.net. Cool water when the sun is shining bright. 
Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Dr. James Kelly, podcaster, public speaker, author, professor, and much more joining me here <laughs> today. Um, before we jump too far ahead, I want to find out how people can find out more about you and how can they listen to your podcast? Ah, thanks for asking. Well, the easiest way to find out more about me is to go to www.drjameskelly, uh, K-E-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can find all the podcasts there. But if you want to save your step, save yourself a step, you can subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, Overcast.fm, pretty much everywhere, and Transformation Radio on the Conscious Business Network as well. That's right. And we're thrilled to have you on our network. I mean, you've actually inspired me. You know, here's what happens, and then we'll go to the question. You know, uh, someone like you shows up, and all of a sudden my team is asking, wow, he's really good, Pat. You know, why don't you ever do a business show? And I'm like, I'm going to let Dr. James Kelly do the business shows, okay? <laughs> I bet you would hit it out of the park. Oh, uh, you know, everyone is is talking about me doing that. And, you know, I actually have a, a show called Enlightened Capitalism. I just don't do it. <laughs> but back to you. <laughs> back to you. All right. Scariest so, moments. It's fun. I mean, I feel like, you know. <laughs> we were talking about, I feel like there's so many, yeah. but I'll, I'll kind of tell one that, that is in scary, but enlightening. And since we, since you were on the police perspective, <laughs> uh, I'll stay on that one. Um, when I was, and I'm not condoning this, uh, at all. When I was 24, um, I was my first job. Uh, I was working for an ad firm that opened up an office in Portland, Oregon. And part of that office, I, I got, you know, I was the manager, so I got a car, which was fantastic at 24. I mean, that's, wow. And, um, but <laughs> I was living with my mom. That's the downside, right? So I'd moved just, I just moved back to Portland from Chicago. And so I was driving, I was out, and I had a few too many drinks, and I was coming back. And I was driving fast, and I remember thinking that I was Mario Andretti, for those of you who don't follow racing, huh. a famous IndyCar race driver. And I remember vividly thinking that. And I come down my street, and it's a quiet neighborhood street, and these lights are behind me. And I pull up to my house. That weekend was the first weekend my mom's new boyfriend had ever stayed the night. <laughs> and I'm getting arrested and put in the back of a car and taken to the jail cell for a DUI that, uh, that, I mean, I deserved for sure. Right. But my, but, but, you know, so you're scared, like, what are you going to do? What happens? And the same note, it's humorous because he, my mom's boyfriend came out in a white t-shirt and tidy whiteies trying to figure out what was going on with this kid. <laughs> he didn't know. So like, and it was the first time I ever met him that weekend, by the way. So I had never met him before in my life. Uh, so it was a very hysterical, but I want to follow up with that though, because that actually was one of my crucibles and Here's what was amazing, and we were talking about this a little bit over the break about crucibles and, and things, is out of that, I went to court, and basically I had the whole thing deferred, but this is what I had to do. I had to spend six months going to outpatient, three hours a night, three nights a week, yeah. and then I had to go to outpatient one night a week for three hours for six months, and then I had to go to therapy to see a counselor for one year, once a month. And it, for me, it was a very clear choice. I could go do this and be bitter, angry, resentful, or I could go and be open to the possibility of learning about myself, about addiction, what it looks like, and enjoy the process. And I chose the latter. And man, was that so transformational for me in helping me be even more authentic, helping me be even more honest. Because when you're around people who have addiction, I'm sure, Pat, you've seen this a thousand yeah. times over. Oh, yeah. Their ability to lie is unbelievable. And they are good at it. And it's only because they're addicted. And so for me, that was one of those – I've had many. But that was one of my crucible moments that was very transformational. 
Yeah, and you know, what you're sharing is exactly what we were talking about before, and that is there are these moments, I believe, in our lives, and you and I have very similar paths. Um, there are these moments in our lives where we could either go left or we could go right, and I'm not making a political statement. I'm just saying we could yeah. go one way or we could go another, and I really don't believe, and, and I love for you to push back on, on this. I love it when I have somebody on that <laughs> will may actually push back on something with me. Um, here, I don't think there's gray. I don't think there's like a gray area. And I've written about this and I've looked at it. And I always come down to, is it really that black and white? What do you think? Yeah, you're going to hate my response. I know. Uh, <laughs> I love that I am, too. <laughs> no, 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 because I agree with you. I think it is black and white. Oh, I think oh that, okay. <laughs> well, you know, well, you know, I'm going to take that back because there okay. are times when, you know, I can think about here, here, here's, here's, a, here's a gray area for me. Okay. Uh, when I went to go get my PhD, I also was accepted to the Peace Corps. And I had an assignment. I was set to go. And I changed my mind last minute. And so I had two decisions. They both were good, right? So for me, that wasn't a black or white choice. Now, that's a positive thing. Now, if we're talking from a mm -hmm. negative spin, um, you know, I had, I had a choice. I quit college when I was 19, and I sold new and used Chevrolets. And uh, I had a choice to do that, and I was making pretty good money at that age. And I'm sure I would have worked my way up. Or I could have gone back to college. Um, I chose the latter because two guys were doing cocaine in the shack, and yeah. asked me if I want to join them. And I kind of saw, I saw the black and white there where I was like, I either am going to be in jail or I'm going to go back to college. So I, I, you know, here's what I say. This is what I say to my students. This is what I say to so many people. It just depends, mm -hmm. right? There are situations that are black and white, but I do think there are areas that are minutia uh, and that you have to wade through for yourself, which one has the best total benefits that you're going to get. You know, there's, there's a wise person that once told me, and if he's listening, I'll give him credit, Brett Smith, who I used to work with, uh, who his philosophy is think forward, reason back. So where do you want to go and how do you get there through what steps do you need to take? And ever since I heard that, I kind of live my life that way now of where I want to go and what do I have to do to get there that's in a safe, happy, healthy, productive way. Yeah. Okay. I need I need some coaching on this. Can you coach me a minute here, Dr. I will Kelly? Coach the, I will coach the heck out of you, Dr. Pat. All right. I am like this four planets in Sagittarius person. I also have four planets in Capricorn. Here's what that means and my moon. Here's what they tell me that means. That means in any given minute, I can say to you, listen, would you like to do a show together? He said, she said, and, and, and then talk about Dr. Kelly, we could do a great show. He said, she said, this is what we could do. And by the way, now here's the Sagittarius. Let me tell you, I got a contact to put it on 200 stations. We can put it in Australia. We could do this. We can, my Capricorn will kick in. And then all of a sudden I'm in such a workaholic work ethic, ethic of my life. But, and by the way, I think that's a great idea. I'm just saying. I don't know where that came from. That, and you know, that's how I know it's a great idea because it didn't come from me. Um, yeah. But here's what I mean by the black and white in my life. Maybe you can help me. Here I am and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden my boss, I worked for the, t by the way, that little male, male job turned into uh, 24 and a half years ending up as a senior executive, uh, worked on the divestiture of the companies. I could write a book about that. And, but it ended up one day I woke up and I looked in the mirror and I think you had that moment too. And I looked in the mirror and I asked myself, who are you? And I went back to work and I told Dr. Ra's doctor, that I was not going to implement the downsizing program. Actually, it was the second in the country. First was Exxon. And I said, I can't do it because you know what? You people lied. And now you're changing the rules. You were going to give people early retirement. You were going to let, and you want me to fire a woman, 29 years, 11 months of service. I'm not doing it. 
And if mm. I said, take my head count. Okay. Here's a moment where you're right. Could I have said, <laughs> I don't know. Could I have said, I'm not doing it, but don't take my head count. Would that have worked? Would there have been another option for me to live in the gray? What are your thoughts on that? I don't regret it for one minute because that sent me. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't do that. But, you know, I think sometimes uh, aliens um, take over my body, Dr. Kelly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think, you know, my question is, what was your guiding principle in that decision? Oh, oh, my God. You know, I, I all my life, it's always been about justice. Mm-hmm. I should have been. Where, I should have been. Where does that come from? Um, I don't know. It's really fascinating. I, you know, I honestly do know. I got to take that back. I think it comes from my stepmom. She was like a super role model for me. Um, and and I, I, I think it's got to be that. But otherwise, I don't know. Because it I also sounds remember. like you're about fairness, equity. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, so... For me, that's not necessarily a great decision because that's impactful on your moral compass. And mm. so when your moral compass is in question, if you have high integrity, your choice is always going to be the choice that you feel best aligns with your personal mission and goals. Mm. So so for me, I'm trying to think what I would do in that situation Um I was six months away from a full pension. And I, actually, the good news was I didn't know that. But let's take a short break because I love this chat now. When we come back, authentic. This is what Dr. Kelly lives and breathes and does. And I'm telling you, if you have not listened to his show, you're going to want to do that. And we got something super special for you. Because the bottom line is, at the end of the day, all of us have got to look in the mirror. When we come back, what is at the heart of authenticity for him? We'll be right back. Are you looking for the perfect setting for your next workshop or retreat? At Spirit Fire Meditative Retreat Center, cultivating consciousness is what we do best. Our guests count on us to create an atmosphere that supports serenity and well-being. We lead from the heart and create space for the mind. Freshly prepared meals designed with local and organic ingredients, 95 acres of beautiful woods and pastures, and a facility built with green in mind. This is what you'll find at Spirit Fire. For more information, visit spiritfireretreatcenter.com. Thrive is what we experience when our mind, body, and soul operate as one. When we thrive, we excel on all levels. Thrive is the mindset that matters. It is essential to our being. Have you ever found yourself looking for the instruction manual on how to thrive? You'll find everything you need to help you feel strong, powerful, and peaceful in your own body. So don't waste any more time. Visit thrivebygen.com today. Tune in to Dynamics of Diversity Radio, scripting the new narrative for immigration with leading experts, Kripa Upadya and Steve Tanijo on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This show will remove the noise that often accompanies discussions on this topic and share a new perspective on the dynamics of immigration and diversity, ever reminding us that together we are all at the core of innovation, excellence, and positive change. Visit OrbitLawPLLC.com for upcoming topics. Have you been seeing numbers like 111 and 222 everywhere you go? Do you feel that the universe may be trying to get your attention, perhaps offering a message of some sort? As it turns out, numerical patterns and certain types of geometry form the very fabric of our reality, from cells under a microscope to the astronomy of our night sky. At Stellar Reflections, we offer special sessions which tap into these patterns, designed specifically to support you on your journey. The 111 and 222 activations are sessions activating new patterns in your energy field, which in turn can help you create new patterns in your life. After just one session with a practitioner, either in person or via distance, clients report gaining greater clarity, becoming more intuitive, and honoring their inner truth as they move forward in their lives. 
Curious about what these transformational sessions might do for you? Call 425-999-9836 or visit StellarReflections.com. That's StellarReflections.com. When your body is awakened, your spirit comes alive. Dana Canetto is a transformational guide, embodiment coach, and spiritual mentor assisting women in realigning with their truth and embodying who they are by connecting to the wisdom of their body. Tune in every month on Transformation Talk Radio and the Dr. Pat Show Network for Body Divinity Radio with Dana Canetto. For more information on Dana and her services, visit danacanetto.com. That's D-A-N-A-C-A-N-N-E-T-O.com. Hey, everyone, welcome back. I got to tell you, it's such an honor to have Dr. James Kelly joining me here today. You know, um, what I love about him and his work and his show, as a matter of fact, is is the following. You heard his story. You guys, you all know me. You know, you've heard my story. The one thing he and I have in common is that we have been dealt some pretty, I'd say, hefty blows to both our egos and our lives. But what is it about him that has enabled him to now become sort of the ambassador of authenticity, to bring a different conversation to the table, and also to have, you know, be on the edge of, of his book that will be coming out before we do that we and, and really this next segment is all you because i want to hear about authenticity some of the people you've interviewed but before we do that you know you have a gift for some of our our listeners can you tell folks what that is yeah so wh- what i want to do is a couple different things i'd love for you to just send me an email and in the email, um, I will collect all those emails. I think, what did I say, the first 25? I think is what I said. Yeah, sounds good. I'm trying to remember, trying to remember what I wrote. Um, and then I will say when the book comes out, I will actually send you uh, a free copy of the book um, at that time, which should be, well, not should be, it will be spring. The exact date is unknown, working with the publisher at this point. Yeah. Was there something else? Did I forget something that, else, Pat? That, that's like a whole – yeah, your website. <laughs> and and, and uh, definitely on Transformation Talk Radio, we let everybody know about it. But, you know, again, uh, let folks know your website so they can find out more about you. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Dr. James Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y.com. Uh, please send me an email. Email is james at drjameskelly.com. And I'd love to hear from you. Even if you have questions, even if you don't want the book, say, hey, I don't want the book, but I have a question. Anything. Just reach out. I respond to every email. Um, I'm passionate about that because you are people and you deserve the respect to be responded to. Yeah. Listen, I'm loving this. This is so important. You know, okay, you've interviewed a lot of people. You live and breathe authenticity (laughs) and being authentic. I know you do. I could tell. But I'm so interested on what that has come to mean to you now, as well as what some of the people, I don't know, can we get a sneak peek on what some of the interviews sound like? Okay, it's all you. So um, one interview that I've had at this point, the the book is 90, but I've interviewed now probably about 120 different people. And there, there are definitely a handful of interviews that just smack you in the face. And one of them was this woman named Marissa Mayer. And she is a gallery owner. She owns her own gallery, Marissa Mayer Art Gallery. And she has a facility in Philadelphia and in L.A. And her story just, I almost started crying when I was listening to it. She was raised in, she was raised in uh, South Jersey. Her mm-hmm. mom was an addict, prostitute. She had six siblings by two different dads, and they lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and they drank out of the toilet bowl and maybe ate once a week, depending on the week, and her mom. And she said that she regularly got beat, sent to the hospital. And what's amazing about her story is that these parents from Central Jersey adopted her and two of her sisters. Now, let's not even mention the sainthood that those two women, those uh, couple get Mm -hmm. In any of this, 
But she goes on to go to university to open an art gallery and to become a multimillionaire. But her two sisters still fall back into addiction and prostitution. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And as she she tells this story, I just I just I'm blown away by her resilience and focus and acceptance of where she's come from, acceptance of her mom, acceptance of her siblings. And she didn't do it on her own. I mean, she got help around her. She had support with her with her uh, step parents, her adoptive parents. I mean, she she didn't get to where she's at by herself. But what I found as I interviewed one guest after another guest who had these crucible moments mm. is that they didn't get there by themselves. Let me give you another example of a guy please, named Joe Burton. Please. Wow, this is fascinating. Wow. So Joe, Bur- Joe Burton is the CEO of Will.com, W-H-I-L.com. And at 40, 38 or 40, he was this chief operating officer of McCann Erickson World Group Advertising. So for any of you in the advertising world, that's one of the largest companies that's owned by Interpublic. I think it's what's called Interrepublic or Interpublic mm-hmm. or something like that, which is a billion plus dollar company. And McCann was roughly just under a billion. And at 42... He goes to his boss and he says, I quit. And his, his boss only statement was, you are stupid uh, because you have the cushiest job now for the next 25 to 30 years. This is at 42. And when I ask him, well, why did you quit? He goes, my wife hated me. My uh, kids hated me. My health was miserable. I was the worst, most angriest boss ever. I had two discs in my spine that were popping out and I came to the realization that what I was doing was going to kill me. That was one of his crucibles. But the other thing that was fascinating about him is that his childhood was a crucible. He grew up in a house full of alcoholics. His dad died early from um, alcohol abuse. Mom had a disease, was in a wheelchair. Um, He had siblings. I think he was the youngest of six. Several of them have passed. I mean, it's one thing after another. So even in his childhood, he had this drive to succeed, and when he succeeded, he was miserable, and then he found mindfulness. And mindfulness just transformed everything for him. Quits his job, starts, has a couple startups, now has a very successful company that works with a lot of major organizations around corporate wellness uh, from the mindfulness space, and he is the most down-to-earth, kind guy I know. Wow. Oh. What? Okay. When you look across the board at the people that are going to be in your book, but also the people you've interviewed, Mm -hmm. can you, can you, I know I'm going to put you on a spot right here. Um, What are the, your top three things that you've seen that you could say this, this group of folks has in common? Yeah. So here, here, I'm going to lay out the framework of the book because this is where it comes from. And so, I want, I want the audience to have a little visualization here. And I, what I want you to do is think of a pyramid with a point going up. And in that pyramid, there's the crucible. All right. And with that, with that pyramid points is to four rectangular boxes that are basically next to each other going from left to right. And each one of these guests that I think really demonstrate the highest level of authenticity had a crucible that made them more self-aware more honest, more relatable to human beings, and have a stronger sense of empathy. And then the top of that, you've got an inverted triangle pointing down because all of these people were driven to learn from books, from oh. themselves, from their peers. Yeah. And it was an amazing thing when I started getting my head around this of seeing here's the common, here's their formula, if you will, for how they became more authentic. And so that's kind of the, I mean, that's really the framework of the whole entire book is here are these people who had crucibles. He, this turned into another set of people who demonstrate the highest level of self-awareness, compa- compassion or empathy, honesty, and relatableness. You know, these people who are super relatable, I find fascinating. I, I consider myself one of these people mm-hmm. where, I yeah. can walk in, where I can walk into, you know, where I used to work in, in the U.S. I knew the janitors, the help. I knew the secretary. Yeah. I knew everybody. Uh, I had a I had a guy on last week, two weeks ago, I think he was on the show, named Mocha Dot. And Mocha Dot is the chief business officer of Google X. 
And he had a great phrase. We were talking about how, how I said everyone puts their pants on the same way. So that's kind of how I look at all my interviews. You know, we all have had some sort of similar problems, desires, wants, needs. And he goes, I have to remind myself before I go into any meeting with big shots, whether it's Larry or Sergey, right, that we all pee standing up or we all pee essentially, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what his point was is that we are all human beings and we have similar desires, like I said, similar desires, wants, and attitudes and behaviors. So we're human at the end of the day. And so Moe's another great example. He'll be in the book as well. I've added him late, but he's another great example of someone who demonstrates this idea of going through a crucible because his son died when his son was 20 years old through a complication. And that put him on this journey to create a formula for happiness. Mm. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I love that you're doing this book and I love that you're bringing this to the forefront because, um, you know, here's what here's what I'm discovering right now. Not from me, because, you know, I I live in some bubble, but from our listeners and uh, we have the best listeners anywhere. They're incredible. And while my show itself, the Dr. Pat show, doesn't specifically focus on business, it does focus on values. And I think authenticity is a serious value. And from a listener point of view, it is the number one from from my audience rather number one reason to buy like and i'm talking about like buy something right oh sure right like i'm gonna go buy like this coffee or i'm gonna go buy something so i just think about that because i'm gonna skip the break so we can talk about this so i mean i actually did research on this so there's a a construct called brand engagement in self-concept and to put it in plain terms we basically buy products that we see ourselves in. And I looked at this in terms of brand communities and that I wanted to know if people who were really high in this, right, really sought out products, brands, services that reflected who they perceived, reflected who they were, their self-concept. I wanted to know if they were more or less likely to engage in those brand communities. When you think of a brand community, it's a community that we belong to, that we interact with, that we leave posts, that we have friends in. You can use examples of like Jeep clubs or Harley Davidson clubs, if you will, where you get people together and all you talk about is that thing, whatever that thing is that gets you fired up. Mm-hmm. And, and so to your point, absolutely, we buy authenticity. You know, I don't, again, I'm not trying to be political, but that was Donald Trump's thing. He sold authenticity to a population of the United States, and they bought it. I would call him charismatic, which in the literature is different than authentic, but nonetheless, it can be perceived as authentic. And so for me, part of this book kind of came out of just looking around the world and looking around that people who are really successful, and we can term successful whatever you want to term it, but they were the most authentic, real, down-to-earth people that you could think of. Wow. You know, here, here it is. Um, one of the things I think you and I both are aware of, especially with our business history um, <laughs> and academic history, right? You, you know, where we've been, where we've put ourselves in life. Um, authenticity uh, doesn't always mean truth, does it? Ooh, how do you mean by that? Isn't that a good question? It is I a can't great even believe I am. I asked that question. <laughs> so, yeah. what do you mean by truth? Here's what I mean. Um, I don't know about you, but I can tell you more times than not, I have either bought something or signed up for for something, or even voted for someone based on how authentic they were, only to find out the product didn't do what they said it was going to do. Mm-hmm. Right. I didn't lose the 10 pounds in five days. And clearly this $500 bottle of cream that I thought would get rid of my, my uh, uh, crow's feet just ain't working. Uh, <laughs> but I'll tell you at the time, maybe that I bought it, you know, that automatic yoga mat 
that was going to do whatever it was going to do. I thought it was, I thought it was true. I thought automatic they were yo automatic yoga, yoga, automatic yoga what, 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 what? Oh yeah. Don't do it. I know. Yeah. I know. It, it's really, I'm sad. You know, I remember I told you I was a Sagittarius. I'm very gullible. I believe pretty much anything, but I think you said something though that was really, really mm -hmm. important. Okay. You, you didn't buy authenticity. You bought the concept or thought of authenticity. It doesn't oh. make it authentic. It's a difference, right? So authentic is real. Perceived authenticity isn't. And people sell perceived authenticity mm. because we all, I think it's human being, right? As a human being, we grab it. Like, I guess imagine like the party you go to, the, the friends that you have, there's always that one or two people who are just always genuinely real. And you say, God, I wish I could be more like X, right? Whatever that X is, more outgoing, more honest, more transparent, more empathy, whatever. Like whatever trait that you are lacking, you seek that out for someone else. It's almost like the yin and yang thing. Yeah. And so, and so I think it's hilarious because my mom is a <laughs> gadget fiend. Every gadget solves every problem. And when she passes away, the amount of gadgets I'm going to have in my house, <laughs> I, I don't even know what I'm going to do with, right? But in her mind, every single time, they sold that authentic story of how it's going to help you. I think this <laughs> left out authenticity and more about a marketing positioning statement about solving a problem. Yeah. You know, the other thing that, that I want to ask you about is the following. Promises. Something that I really have dedicated a lot of years to understanding and researching. But I want to ask you your current view and talking to the people you've talked to. How hard is it for executives to keep their word? And I want to ask you for a number of reasons. Even if their word is like all over the map, how hard do they say it is? for them to keep their promises to their employees? You know, that that, that is not a question that I've asked specifically. So mm -hmm. what I will say to that mm -hmm. is that it is always apparent to me that the leaders who are most authentic yeah. have the ability to be transparent in good and in bad times. And they have the empathy to think of their employees in a way that says, what would I want if I was them? Would I want smoke blown or would I want the truth? And by using their moral compass, which is part of this idea of being authentic, they almost always side on telling the truth. Now, I might be biasing this because that's just my personal philosophy, yeah. but I but but the people I've really clicked with around this and and really felt a kinship towards their ability to be real yeah. and authentic were the ones that were kind of no BS. Like they're going to tell mm -hmm. you what it is, but mm -hmm. but they're going to tell you in a way that, and I think this is a distinction. You know, I say honesty is one of these traits for authentic leadership. When I say when I say honest, I don't mean like those pair of pants make you look fat, Jimmy. Yeah. Not like that type of honesty. <laughs> what I mean by honesty is. Listen, here's the real situation. I'm going to tell you what it is and what you do with it is kind of on you, right? So, for example, we probably all have had an employee that probably shouldn't have been at the organization. And a good, authentic leader is going to sit down with that employee and say, listen, your skill set is X. I don't think it's best suited for here. Let me help you find a different place to go. And at the time, and, I, and again, countless people you talk to, they say, I had that moment and my feelings were hurt. I was sad. I was a little bit resentful. But in hindsight, one, two, three, four, five years later, ah, they were right. They were being honest and true. I wasn't ready to hear it yet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, first of all, I want to thank you so much for today. And I want to thank you for all that you do, because I think in the dynamics of the world we're living in today, you know, people are trying to make sense. They're trying to make sense of their lives. They're trying to make sense of what's going on in the workplace. 
And, you know, how do I show up? I want to ask you this, this, this last question, I, I think, because I know you've got to run. Is authenticity being rewarded in corporate America? I think it depends on the – so here's my gray area. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> it depends on the size of the organization, and it depends mm. on who's leading the organization. I think in larger organizations, Fortune 500 companies, companies with employee, employees – Two, three, four hundred plus. Mm -hmm. It's. It, I think in some ways it's frowned upon because, specifically in the U.S. and and having lived in Japan, Australia, now the Middle East, and Philadelphia, Chicago, San Jose, Portland, Oregon, I, I can tell you that, in the U.S., we are so driven and so competitive that I think for a large majority of people, and maybe I'm overstating this, we lose sight about the human qualities, the human aspects of the people around us. And I don't see that as often when I talk to individuals from different countries. I see that so high. When I lived in Australia, you know, every week, a majority of employees would go out for afternoon drinks, whether they drank or not. But it was part of that social bonding with your organization. And, you know, now in the U.S., and, and maybe I'm missing it, you know, it's it's Friday. I got to go. It's 5 o'clock. I'll see you guys later. Mm. You know, and, oh, it's Tuesday. It's 5 o'clock because we are so busy. I mean, I have four kids. And, you know, I have friends of mine that actually live in Seattle. They moved there from, from Philadelphia, and they've got four kids. Mm. And those guys run around like a chicken with its head cut off. Going to a sporting event here, sporting event there, sporting event here. Like, and my wife and I just think, like, I don't know how they do it. And when they have time just to sit and be, and uh, and I, we love these people to death. Like, they're the greatest people, and we are in all they can do it. But it also speaks to the fact that our lives are so busy, and it begs the question that we spend eight hours plus a day to organization. Wouldn't it nice? Wouldn't it just be nice to be real for at least four and a half of those hours of eight? Like, yeah. and so you know. But I can tell you, I've I've rubbed people the wrong way in organizations by just being honest and transparent because yeah. not not everyone loves it. Yeah, and you know, you're absolutely right. Um, even if even if it gives them, uh, you know, gives employees a heads up about a potential downsizing, let's say, or restructuring, let's say, um, because some of this is honestly too hard to face on any given day. Um, I have one last question. Thank you so much. Please give out your no, website no, no. again. Um, this has been so much fun. It's great to have you on the show. My last pleasure. question, personal message. What would you like to leave us with today? And thank you. Uh, so just to answer your first question, website is drjameskelly.com, K-E-L-L-E-Y. And my motto, and I will, I will drum it into my kids' heads for as long as they live, is don't let fear conquer you, conquer fear. Wow. Thank you so much for today. And for those of you out there, we'll make sure all of you are well aware of Dr. James Kelly, his book, so forth and so on. Um, Benny, what a great show. We're going to take a, a shorty. And when we come back, for those of you, I just want to tell you, yeah, Chef Rossi is in the house. The show is called Mouthing Off. We'll be right back. The audio was via a Skype call.